Uh, again, welcome to the July Wisconsin Maple Hour. And uh, this month, we're going to be looking at the Sugarbush Forest Health with Paul Segan, a forest health specialist with the Wisconsin DNR. And my name is Tony Johnson. I'm the Wisconsin Extension Maple Syrup Project Manager. I'm calling in today from Fond du Lac County, Wisconsin. And I uh, my position is 50% maple manager, and then I've got a 50% uh, forest outreach position. So I also do a lot of uh, forestry management uh, planning with private landowners all across the state. So with that, I'm going to stop my screen share and introduce Paul Segan from the DNR. So Paul, could you just give us a little bit of a background on yourself and um, just a little bit about your current position with the DNR? Sure, Tony, will do. Let me get my screen going here and um... I'll have one last thing to think about while I'm talking. Okay, Tony, do you see just the opening slide? Nope, you'll have to switch the display settings. Okay, we will swap that out. Okay. How are we now? Okay, good. Yeah, well, thanks so much for the invite, Tony. I'm happy to be here with y'all. Um, Paul Segan, DNR Forest Health Specialist covering Northwest Wisconsin. I've been with the Division of Forestry now uh, since 2014 in this position. I started out in the Spooner uh, Ranger Station office. And after a couple of years, I uh, got a transfer up here to Hayward. So my home base is in office is at the Hayward Service, DNR Service Center in Hayward. But I do cover uh, the nine counties permanently in the Northwest. Douglas, Bayfield, Ashland, on down to um, Barron, Rusk, and, uh, and Polk counties is the farthest south I go. But I have some interim coverage right now. Um, I'll just show you the quick map here so you can see Todd Lanigan is one of the forest health specialists who retired recently. Um, and so I'm covering five additional counties down there, St. Croix, Dunn, Chippewa, and Pierce, I believe are the interim coverage counties. So covering a big area. Um, my background is in, in forestry. I got a um, uh, undergraduate degree in, in forestry, um, specifically urban, actually urban forestry and conservation biology minor um, at Wisconsin Stevens Point back in 2010. And then uh, after a, a little less than a year of, of working for USGS out in Colorado, I uh, started, um, I enrolled in a graduate program at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Alberta and got a master's of, of forest science up there. Um, I then applied for the job with the DNR. Uh, the, the day I was defending my thesis and I came out of the chamber, I got a call uh, on my voice message that I was offered an interview for this job. So the timing was pretty impeccable and I was, I was on top of the world and it all worked out. I, I got the offer and I, and I moved back up to uh, Northwest Wisconsin. I'm originally from Chippewa Falls, Wisconsin. So it was, uh, it was a good fit for me. And, um, but it's still up here. It's still kind of exotic. You know, you're up in the deep woods and uh, my zone covers a few different forest cover types, the Northwest Sands, um, that kind of boreal zone in the Northwest part of Douglas County. And then um, along the, the Lake Superior um, Basin, and then, um, you know, a little bit of that Northern music forest too. So a good mix and a good variety. It always keeps me on my toes. We're dealing with a lot of different insect and, and disease pests each, each summer. So yeah, really enjoy the job. My zone does not have a ton of, uh, you know, Northern music forest and sugar maple specifically. So um, some of this was a little bit of a refresher. It was good to kind of check back in with some of these issues that can be an issue in the, um, for health issues in the in the sugar bush, but um, yeah, I'd like to get uh, get more field experience in this area. But um, I just want to you know note that we we are here for you. I'm on a. It's not just me up here. I coordinate the forest health program in the northwest part of the state, but I'm on a pretty big team and a well supported team by the Wisconsin DNR. We have our team leader uh, Becky Gray down in Fitchburg, uh, and we have a we have a full blown pathologist on staff, uh, Kyoko Scanlon. Uh, who is fantastic at uh, doing diagnostics and running tests on samples. We send to her wood samples, foliar samples. We do oak wilt tests. We do our malaria tests, heterobacidian root disease, all kinds of different disease uh, types tests that are run through both, um, uh, both culture and, and uh, PCR, DNA tests. So full-blown lab, uh, we do a lot. And we process samples for free for landowners who 
you know, own own acreage and actually have a, a forest health scale issue that they're trying uh, to diagnose. We would we would be your point people for that. And that's a good point to bring that up that we do get um, a number of urban calls for urban tree health, but our focus is really on the woodlot size and up. Um, and so if you have you know, issues and you need some help with diagnostics, management recommendations, whether it's a sugar bush or whether it's an oak stand what, or jack pine stand, whatever it is, uh, we are here to help support you. Uh, you don't have to be in the MFL program. You don't have to be in some kind of forest management plan at all. Uh, this is a free service for you. And it's, it's pretty cool. Not all states offer this. In fact, a friend of mine from Colorado, he told me when we go out to do a site visit, we uh, we charge $60 to a landowner. That was prior to COVID. So I wonder I wonder what that is now. Who knows what the cost is? But yes, it's a really good service to take advantage of. On the team, we also deal with um, invasive plants. So we have an invasive plant specialist, Mary Bartkowiak. She's located in the Rhinelander office and covers the statewide um, statewide uh, realm of invasive plant management issues, uh, mapping, um, identification, uh, grants management, um, helping foresters and landowners plan treatment and the control plans for their property. Um, and then we do a lot of education and outreach on our team too. A big part of our job is to um, engage in presentations like this, uh, as well as write news releases in case that there's a big insect outbreak, for example, we're working on one right now, or to send out periodic news releases about recurring issues like oak wilt prevention. So a lot of, uh, a lot of education goes into this. And um, I'll just show you the regional distribution of us right now. You know me now. Uh, Linda Williams, fantastic veteran of the Forest Health team covering Northeast uh, Wisconsin, Alex Feltmeyer, our most recent uh, hire for the Forest Health team as a specialist in the central zone, Bill McNee, another great veteran, Mike Hillstrom as well. So you can see our coverage zones. We cover pretty big areas and we're all sort of, if, if your property or your issue falls within uh, a specific zone, it's best to contact the person within that zone um, so we can balance the work load appropriately. Uh, something to be aware of uh, as, as for enrichment and your awareness is to uh, potentially sign up for our newsletter. We send out usually during the growing season every month, we put together a number of pertinent articles that are timely to what we're observing in the field, issues we're encountering, could be a spongy moth, jack pine budworm outbreak. It could be needle browning that's you know kind of unusual for that particular year or month of the season. And so you can sign up if you go to the DNR's homepage here and go down to the little icon of uh, that envelope, click on that. And you can actually um, select which articles you, you know, you can select some parameters of the articles. Do you want to get the whole statewide forest health article? Do you want to get just for a specific region? Because we try to break up the issues by region if it's specific to one, or a lot of times these issues transcend a whole zone. They might be all of Northern Wisconsin as opposed to just the Northwest or Northeast. So, uh, but there is some, uh, some parameter you can select on that. And what you will get is basically an email, uh, an email feed each month where you get access to these articles you can click on. This is one, I just an example of one from a while ago, region-wide needle tip browning on red pine. So, so show some kind of cool pictures, talk about the observation, talk about the implication that it might have on the forest um, or your trees and any kind of steps to mitigate it. So um, pretty cool, um, definitely worth uh, checking out. And then the other thing I should point you to is this um, website that we have. We have a very robust website on the DNR's, um, DNR's website. We have a forest health page and on that page are a bunch of sub pages on different uh, forest pests and disease issues, oak wilt, um, uh, heterobacidian root disease, beech bark disease, thousand cankers disease, emerald, it's just tons and tons of information, fact sheets, documents um, with guidance on managing forest in light of these pests. So a really good resource. A lot of what you might be looking for might already be out there. So definitely keep this website in mind and consult it um, for further support um, in doing the work you're doing. Um, I should mention, I didn't put a slide in for this, Tony, but the UW Extension has some very good resources, both the um, insect uh, uh, diagnostic lab that's run by PJ Leash, and then also the um, plant disease diagnostic clinic run by Brian Huddleston. 
for more yard tree type things, that plant disease diagnostic clinic is a really good go-to. It's a four service, um, it's a four fee service, uh, but they provide really good turnaround on samples and are, are really good for the urban environment to hone in on what might be causing a tree health issue on your property. It could be abiotic or it could be fungal and, uh, or uh, viral, whatever disease in nature. And they can usually pin it down pretty good. So I'd check out their website, the U UW Plant Disease Diagnostic Clinic. Um, and then for insect identification, we can help with that, uh, but also the identification lab in, in at UW Madison is really helpful for that too. Um, so if there's nothing else, Tony, I was thinking about just jumping right in um, to some of these issues. So um, something to note here is that <laughs> There's a lot of different pest and disease issues in a forest, and they all range in how much they impact the forest based on a bunch of different factors. Sometimes we have inherently benign um, insects or diseases that cause a big splash. They maybe outbreak in a year or two, last for a little bit, and then disappear. Uh, they might never come back for another 20 or 25 years, and I won't know about it unless I go back and read the forest health report. Um, but there are other issues that are are actually very damaging and important to the forest ecosystem and the sugar bush that uh, you should be aware of. I'm going to cover today a, a little bit of both. I, I took a sampling, and this is really just a, a sample of a, a number of different things that can be present in the sugar bush and can affect it. I'll try to decipher which is more important and which is, to a lesser extent, uh, an impact on the bush. But in any case, um, just recognize that every Every pest or disease is, is different in its impact. Some can look dramatic and really have little impact. Some may not appear that dramatic, but could uh, whittle away at, at, uh, at trees over time. Um, so we'll start off with this one. This is the green striped maple worm. This is one I've had a little bit of experience uh, here in the Northwest part of the state. And also it's been active in North, Northern Wisconsin, Northeast Wisconsin as well. Let's see, the dates uh, when it was most active was uh, 2020 was the first year we had uh, green striped maple worm show up on the scene. And this was one that I had never seen before on the job. I hadn't heard about, I hadn't read about it in any of our annual reports. I, I apparently I didn't dig deep enough because it was in there. But this is kind of an unusual insect that pops up periodically. It's a native. It's a big fat a caterpillar you can see with green stripes down its, down its back there. And it will consume the majority of red maple leaves in an area where it's undergoing an outbreak. So first appearance of this was 2020 in Burnett County. This isolated stand of about 40 acres was just uh, demolished by this insect. I mean, as far as defoliation and what it left behind was a real skeletonized looking leaf. You can see in that top right photo is just petioles and, and leaf veins left behind um, from this caterpillar. But the timing was right about now. I'm getting reports of it now again this year. So we had it was uh, 2020, and then we had 20, so since 2020, it was 2020, 2021, 22, and now 23. We're going on four years, which is a big surprise for this insect that I hadn't seen prior to this, but it just, it's picking up a little bit of inertia. Good news about it, though, is it's a more of a late season defoliator. The caterpillars are probably about to go into pupation stage pretty quick, but they're not actually most of them are not mobs yet, but they will turn into this rosy maple moth, this beautiful um, <laughs> kind of delicate colored moth on the bottom there. You can see the bottom right. Uh, really pretty, but um, people freak out about this thing. It can be a problem in forests, um, but I think really where you're going to want to pay more of attention to it, pay more attention to it, is when you have a yard tree. This would be more of a yard tree issue where you might consider doing a BT application or some kind of imidacloprid application if it's a soil drench to a larger tree, something like that. But usually for a forest situation, this is not going to be a major problem, um, but it, it can cause quite a bit of defoliation. Um, just an awareness thing more than anything with the green striped maple worm. Another one that's been busy this year, and I first saw it in 2017. So the last active years I have on, on note were 2017, 2021, and 2023 is the maple petiole borer. And I, I've seen actually a lot of leaves on the ground in a, in a forest from maple petiole borer. So, Usually right around early, the early part of June, you'll start to see almost fully developed leaves that look green and healthy, just all scattered on the ground. And for, in my case, it's on the running trail or on the, on the biking trail out in the woods. On my, when I'm out there on my day off, I see all these leaves. That was how it happened this summer. And I thought, okay, there we go. Uh, maple petiole borer again on the scene, but 
when you look up at the crown, although it looks like quite a bit of leaf shed, it's really not a high percentage of the overall crown density. So this is really a, a, a pest that can look dramatic, at least if you're looking on the ground, but doesn't usually cause much of an impact because it's not a high proportion of the overall crown foliage. Um, it's a small sawfly. You can see that picture on the lower left that's um, kind of burrowing in and feeding inside that petiole, weakening it and causing it to fall off. That top right image, you can see kind of a black necrotic uh, base of the petiole where that leaf is losing strength and, and detaching. So keep an eye out for this, but more just, uh, just an awareness for the, for the sugar bush if you see this. Okay, spongy moth. Uh, probably doesn't need a big introduction. You've probably all heard of spongy moth. It is in total outbreak mode this year. I put up a map on the upper left and it is, uh, it's been a very busy season just for spongy moth alone. Those areas in red are big contiguous blocks I mapped of spongy moth defoliation. And I pr probably that is a, a pretty significant underestimation at least up on that Bayfield Peninsula where I did do an aerial survey and flew for it. Um, and I'm going to back up for a second because, you know, Tony had asked me to talk about a little bit about what I do. And so this is a good example up here on that left. Um, just about two weeks ago, I was doing uh, aerial survey flights for major uh, defoliating insects in my zone in the northwest part of the state. The first one was the spongy moth. You can see I, I, I flew up in the air uh, and, and mapped the damage that I could see from the ground. And then the next day I was over in Douglas and Washburn County flying for the jack pine budworm. We go up in a small um, Cessna aircraft, 182 usually, and we fly anywhere from about 700 to 15 feet uh, off, the, off the, the ground height. And we have little tablet PCs that we're, that we're mapping the damage um, on, and we can attribute it to whatever, whatever it happens to be. In this case, it was spongy moth. Uh, another case, it was jack pine budworm. And maybe next year it's going to be the, the forest tent caterpillar. We'll have to see. But that's pretty exciting part of the job in the summer. But beyond that, you know, I'm getting a lot of calls from landowners. Hey, what do I do about the spongy moth? When is the DNR going to spray? Uh, what is the DNR doing about this? Um, is there any help you can provide? What guidance can you give? So fielding a lot of calls, landowners who want me to come and visit their property. So setting up site visits. That's a big part of the, the summer period, um, setting up site visits and going and assessing people's property, um, looking at various trees that are showing symptoms and, uh, and diagnosing either on the spot or collecting samples for a little bit of additional um, uh, diagnostic support and then following back up with them with management recommendations. So a uh, lot of field time in the summer, a lot of mapping in the plain um, and trying to keep track of, of the extent of all these, all these major issues. So back to spongy moth specifically, you can see uh, what was mapped was a large amount of acreage. This was about over 200,000 acres and uh, is probably a little bit of an underestimation, but mostly in the Bayfield Peninsula and then Ashland County. Um, there's reports of it down in Southeast Wisconsin a little bit, but not nowhere near the scale. Spongy moth is important because it, it can go after maple. Usually, and what I'm seeing up in Bayfield County is it's not as prevalent on maples. Maples actually look pretty good and they've largely been spared. Preferred hosts for this up there are, are apple. And of course we have a lot of orchard up there, oak and aspen. Those were the most heavily hit species and defoliated by the spongy moth and early season caterpillar defoliator. Um, right about now up in, Northern Wisconsin, these large caterpillars are largely have gone into um, pupation, which is shown in that uh, lower right image. That's a pupil chamber or case where the caterpillar is um, pupating into the moth and the moth will be on the landscape for several weeks. Uh, the females do not fly. They're white colored buff kind of uh, uh, buff cream colored moths. They don't fly, the males fly to them they will mate and then these females will lay eggs on, on all kinds of different things, <laughs> outdoor furniture, chairs, trees, your side of your house, all kinds of stuff. So we, we have a whole bunch of different guidance for uh, spongy moth mitigation um, that rely on mechanical means like removing the egg masses, trying to capture the caterpillars when they're active, um, and then also treating trees with insecticides. 
the DNR does not spray for spongy moth anymore. We get a lot of questions about that. We used to have a spray program that has been sunset um, uh, at least I think four years ago now. Uh, the Department of Ag does do some spraying for spongy moth, but only this year was in 10 counties on the western side of the state. And that's more for preventing uh, or slowing down westward, it, for slowing down westward expansion of this insect. Um, so this is one to definitely be aware of. There are years where this could be a problem in the sugar bush where these will go after sugar maple, um, especially if they've depleted some of their other host. Um, but so far in my, in my tenure, I'm not seeing a lot of impacts on the maple, at least in the last couple of years, but something to definitely be aware of. To show you this image on the, uh, of, from the aerial survey I did, you can see looking out, this is the Shawamigan Bay a little bit on the right here and then up into the Apostle Islands on the left. Really, really cool imagery from up there in water world flying it. But you can see kind of in the middle of the picture that kind of red tinge color, that's mostly heavily, heavily defoliated oak. And then on the kind of left side of the photo is mostly aspen and they look just white. You can see the white colored branches, crowns and stems of those aspen showing up as they've been almost completely denuded of defoliation. So when this thing pops, it, it really pops. We're expecting probably another moderate, heavy to moderate year next year. That would be year three up here. And then after that, diseases and parasites will largely uh, bring spongy moth back into check. Like a lot of insects, it relies on um, warm, dry conditions in the spring for larval or caterpillar development. And we obviously did not see, uh, we saw those conditions. We didn't see the wet and cool conditions, which would otherwise uh, keep them more at bay. So it was a really ripe year for spongy moth. We'll jump in and talk for a second about the uh, forest tent caterpillar because this thing could be the next spongy moth and this will have a bigger impact in sugar maple forests for sure because it prefers uh, sugar maple, birch, and some of the other northern hardwoods quite well. I put up a map of the last outbreak. I think this was from uh, around 2001. You can see we mapped a huge swath of northern and northwest Wisconsin during that last outbreak. And this is an insect like spongy moth. Spongy moth is maybe on a between six and 10 year um, population uh, outbreak cycle. Forest tent caterpillar is also on an outbreak cycle. This, however, is a native insect. Outbreak cycles are about six to 10 years. And during those times when it outbreaks for a, a couple to a few years, it's really dramatic. And it's across a huge section of area, bigger than spongy moth even. Um, we're talking millions of acres affected by this thing. Generally, trees are going to be able to cope with this. And sugar maple will put on a second flush of leaves about a little around a month or a little bit more than a month after they're defoliated. This can cause stress to the tree, obviously, uh, but the trees can cope with a couple of years of heavy defoliation. When we get into three years and we add maybe drought on top of it, then we're really looking at trouble for the health of sugar maple and possibly death. Um, defoliation too can affect some of the production and the you know, quality characteristics of, of, of uh, sap and, and syrup. I don't know as much about that. Some might be able to speak to that but it definitely can affect production and also growth in these, in these types of stands. Images here you can see on the right are this gregarious caterpillar. This is also an early season defoliator, which is going to be uh, active as a caterpillar in Northern Wisconsin, roughly between uh, last third, like the third week in May through the end of June, it's going to be active. And then the eggs are, uh, they are cemented onto little twigs and branches, usually of aspen, could be birch, and they look like a, basically a band with all those little cells are, are eggs and the small larvae have hatched out of there. You can see in that image on the bottom. Not all years, but a lot of years I will do surveys. I'll do winter surveys for the forest tent caterpillar to monitor it, particularly because we're expecting a really big outbreak to come up here fairly soon. We're on, I think the 20th, we're on the 22nd year since the outbreak now. So the last, the outbreak really receded in 20, that huge year was 20, uh, 2001. And it really died off after that. And we haven't seen for a variety of reasons, haven't seen that, that outbreak really um, come, come to head here. So we're way overdue. In fact, this is the longest interphase right now between outbreaks in, in our history of recording the forest health condition in Wisconsin since about back in the 40s. 
there are a couple of reasons for that. The polar vortex year of 2014 was probably a year that set them back. We had very cold, uh, extremely cold conditions that year. Um, that probably led to quite a bit of egg mortality, even though this is native and those eggs can persist down to very cool temperatures. You know, when we're getting into negative 33 and for a couple of days of that, yeah, yeah that can cause some of that egg mortality. Uh, same thing, I think it was in 2018, we saw a really frigid year. And then we've generally had, you know, from about 2010 to 20, uh, 2020, uh, fairly wet conditions, at least in northern Wisconsin. Actually, I think all of Wisconsin, when I've looked at some of the data recently, um, unusually wet conditions in that springtime will keep uh, defoliator like forest tent at bay. Another quick factor is late spring frosts. Late spring frosts can set back these developing caterpillars while they're small and susceptible to that freeze damage. So we've had quite a few of those since I've been on almost every year. It seems like we get kind of a cold snap get down to 25 or so all the way into late May. So that can have a factor, but uh, watch out for this. You, you're gonna see this on the landscape. You're gonna see some of these uh, larva caterpillars. They have almost like a keyhole shape of segments running down their back. At the point you're seeing these around your forest is seeing a, a number of them, maybe you know a handful, like start thinking about that, report it to the forest health specialist in your zone, because that would be an early warning sign that things could be picking up. Typically it's how it works with these insects is that we get a couple of years where we start to see more either moths on the landscape or more of the caterpillars. The trees look okay, it doesn't really reach damaging levels to the tree, but there's an indication that the population is increasing. And we, we tend to get that warning a year or two before we get a big outbreak. Uh, next one we'll jump into is the sugar maple borer. You've probably all seen this. If you've been around sugar maple, of course you have that kind of gouge that goes uh, kind of crossways through the main stem of a sugar maple. This is a native borer species that uh, goes after generally low vigor sugar maple, um, and it can cause a problem. It uh, is a two-year life cycle, and in that first year, it's, it's basically going vertical. It lays its eggs in the crevices of bark on the, the, the adult does on the outside of the bark. They will hatch and the larva will burrow upward vertically. But then in year two, it goes out a little bit further toward the interface of where the bark meets the sapwood. And it will cause that larger gouge. That's almost like a, you, know, you, can, you can see what it is. It, it causes a girdling effect on the tree. This can lead to portions of the crown above dying because of a lack of um, you know, water, water uh, you know, and the vascular system is damaged, so it can't deliver as much water and nutrients. That, that process becomes hampered and it can affect production too. So uh, this thing is easier to control, keeping stands vigorous, keeping them um, appropriately stocked, not too much competition and also not too much light as well. This is, a, I think, a light loving insect too, can be helpful for this one. Um, that middle image you can see is a tree that has been infested and uh, the bark is just kind of concealing where uh, that damage has, has happened from the sugar maple borer. It's recommended to remove these trees when there's a thinning in a, in a sugar bush to kind of, because they're going to be more compromised in the long run as far as production, growth. So kind of removing them to improve the stocking. Uh, these would be good targets, considered higher risk trees for the future. Uh, rotation. So, yep, getting them out of there. Okay, this was an interesting one that some of my colleagues um, down in south central Wisconsin noticed in, sh in a sugar maple stand around the arboretum. Uh, I think this was two years ago now. We linked um, a percentage, about 15% of dying sugar maple seedlings back to ambrosia beetle. Now, this, this is a known issue in sugar maple, uh, but it seems to be fairly uncommon in Wisconsin. But uh, in this particular stand, we noted between, I think it was like in the plots that were surveyed, like six and 33% of uh, the seedlings would start to yellow out and end up dying. And so it was kind of mysterious, but we dug into it a little bit. And what they found was that there's this uh, native ambrosia beetle that uh, is going into uh, the stem uh, just underneath, about an inch underneath where the uh, stem meets meets the ground, and girdling inside of it, and causing these uh, sap these seedlings to die. So, yeah, this has been a noted issue in sugar bushes, but again, fairly uh, 
fairly uncommon in Wisconsin, at least to our knowledge, but it is something to keep an eye out for and it uh, could potentially be an issue at some point. As far as controls go, um, not really sure. I don't think we know enough about it to really say, but it is something to just keep an eye out if you see something like that. And while we're on the topic of regen, we'll jump right into jumping worms, which you probably have, uh, have heard of. We've been trying to track this issue more in the state. And this definitely can be an issue in sugar maple stands. It's becoming more common that we're finding jumping worms uh, and the infestation is uh, more widespread than we initially thought. The first um, confirmed um, detection of, of jumping worms in Wisconsin was 2013. But since then, if we, as we've done surveys, we've quickly realized it's, it's more widespread in Wisconsin, even some counties in, in Northern Wisconsin as well. The real problem with jumping worms is, is sort of a similar problem to any European earthworms we have in the sugar bush generally. And that is that as these worms infest the stand, they can alter the, both the chemistry and the physical structure of the soil. Uh, we know that sugar maple are fairly, have fairly sensitive root systems and many of those roots are up toward the surface. And some of, the, some of those fine roots dwell in the duff layer. When you have worms that move in, they consume a lot of organic matter and consume it fairly effectively and fairly quickly. And they can change the soil horizons by removing a lot of that organic matter where you might have sugar maple uh, fine roots in that are then more prone to uh, higher temperatures, more prone to um, lack of water absorption, and um, just overall more compaction in that soil as well. As the soil gets consumed and we get more of a um, kind of a pelletized granular type of structure. You can see that image on the bottom left. So these worms are, you know, they're not good for a forest ecosystem. There's some conflicting information. People often think, well, worms are great for the home garden, right? Or, you know, they help recycle. And there, there is some, there's some validity to that, but it's really a large part about the rates of that cycling and about the requirements of some of the native flora. Uh, both the both understory plants and then also tree roots are not really accustomed to that rate of turnover, and they are accustomed to having certain horizons in the soil and certain chemistry that is is maintained. So these can be really problematic. And like with jumping worms, the bigger problem here is really these cocoons on the top right. Those cocoons um, are how this thing generally spreads. Uh, big modes of spread that we've linked back to new locations are from the planting industry, like, like the nursery industry, and then plant sales. You can see an image of that pot. When you're buying something at, say, a, a nursery or a plant sale, um, it could well have soil media that is infected with cocoons of this uh, worm, and they can get to a new site when you plant out. Same thing with mulch. Mulch is also a, a problem, a vector for spread of these cocoons and the jumping worms. Um, Prevention is really important with jumping worms because we don't have any really good controls at this point. We're experimenting, we're working with researchers, um, one at UW to experiment with a type of fertilizer early bird, um, which is I believe a high phosphorus fertilizer that could be applied to kill and reduce the populations of these uh, jumping worms, but it's really tentative at this point. And so we're recommending caution when you're buying nursery stock, when you're buying, um, plants at sales or buying mulch. And heat treatment is a really, uh, really good way to try to kill uh, these cocoons. It doesn't take much heat. I think it's around 110 degrees of heating compost temperature and these things can be killed. So um, always good to be cautious with this one. Uh, just a comparison between our uh, European nightcrawler, very common in the, the jumping worm. Here's a side by side. With the jumping worm, you're going to see more of a brown gray color versus a pink and reddish color of our uh, Lim Limbruscus, I think it is, the European uh, nightcrawler. Bodies are sleek and smooth and firm versus thick, slimy, floppy bodies of our more familiar earthworm. And then the big difference here uh, in terms of is a behavioral one where the jumping worm acts really active and thrashes around when it's handled. So if you come to a site and you see some worms, you end up touching them or disturbing them a little bit. The jumping worm got its name because it often will jump and thrash around um, on the ground. It's also called snake worm too, because it will slither like a snake very quickly and abruptly. So that's one way. The other thing is this, uh, this feature on the body called the clitellum. It's a, it's a reproductive structure. Um, in the jumping worm, it's a light colored, smooth clitellum that is flush with the body. It's relatively close to the head and completely circles the body. 
this is probably this is a good defining characteristic compared to the European earthworm, where it's more of a reddish uh, clitellum, slightly raised, raised up off the body, and partially encircles the body like a saddle. So um, keep an eye out for that. Both of these are not good with jumping worm. It's it's actually important that you might report the location if it's a new county. We do have a map online that shows the distribution. I don't have it on here, but the distribution of this, and we're we are trying to continue to track it so we know kind of its whereabouts within the state. So uh, jumping into some of the cankers we have here, this is Utapella canker. This can be a problem in the sugar bush. You've probably all seen this before. I think it's actually. It's not necessarily good to see if you're in a production, but it is one of the more kind of, if I can say, pretty or neat features of an old growth woods. Um, tends to infect uh, older trees, at least that's where you see it more. It can infect younger trees as well, but it leaves that kind of big, almost like a cobra shape. If you were to look at the tree on that picture, that image on the right, from the other side, you'd almost see the flares of a cobra head. Um, and then over time, as this canker develops after like five or six years, it can develop um, the presence of this other fungus, Oxyporus populinus, inside of it, which is called the mossy top conch. And that conch will grow moss on top of it. So it kind of a kind of a dual infection going on there. And this thing tends to really weaken the stem and can cause obviously wind throw and, and stem snap over time. Um, best way to manage this is to, it's actually to cut these trees out during the harvest cycle, getting rid of these trees is really important because um, they can obviously spread spores. So reducing inoculum through sanitation, important way to, to reduce the incidence of this. And then we have sap streak disease. This is um, eh, somewhat common in sugar maple, uh, mostly a, a sugar maple problem. It usually is identified by seeing kind of a thin crown where leaves are maybe half the size on that top right. It's kind of a poor image, but you get the picture. A thin crown maple, uh, chlorotic looking, um, stunted leaves, and these can these can happen pretty quickly. This is a quick moving disease. Uh, typical modes of entry for it gets in when uh, roots are damaged during sugaring operations or harvesting operations, where there's you know damage from heavy equipment or scuffing, mechanical injury, uh, right to um, the root flare or the lower stem of the tree. Another very common mode of entry, how this gets in is when there's a cluster of stems and one of them is cut. That top right image shows one of the stems is cut off. Well, that's a great what we call infection court, a port of entry for uh, the, this fungus to enter into that tree. Um, it's not thought to enter very well through tapping uh, injury or any kind of other types of major stem injury. It's usually more down at that uh, root flare roots and then also those clusters of stems that were cut. So definitely something to avoid in doing harvest and marking is don't, don't cut off single stems like that, uh, at least for the sake of reducing sap streak disease introduction into the tree. Um, this thing can show up in the matter of a year. A tree can go from really healthy to it won't leaf out the next year, or a tree can um, die over the course of two years. But usually they don't recover from this, if I recall right, and uh, it is really hampering the vascular function of this tree. The vascular system is, is basically getting clogged up and it cannot move fluids effectively and starts to almost dehydrate, almost like an oak wilt or Dutch elm disease, similar type of concept. And one of the other things that can happen with it is that armillaria root disease can move into these trees too. Armillaria we'll talk about in a second, also known as shoestring root rot is a fairly common ubiquitous fungal disease that can go after uh, stressed trees. So. Um, sap streak disease can be avoided and, and it should through um, sound forestry measures. Okay, armillary root disease. So bottom left shows the honey mushrooms there. These are a cluster of basidiocarps mushrooms, our traditional sense of a mushroom. Um, you can identify these loosely. Uh, definitely talk to an expert and get a guide if you ever want to go out. These are edible and they can be picked and consumed and they're, they're quite delicious. Um, some would even say choice, but they usually grow in clusters. They have that kind of annulus or ring, usually just underneath the, underneath the gills there on the cap. And um, they can grow either on dead and decaying stumps or wood on the ground, or they can grow just right out of the soil. But 
regardless of that, they're always connected to rotting wood. If you follow even ones emerging from the ground far enough, they're connected to um, a root system or um, underground wood that is decaying and dying. This is considered a secondary uh, fungal disease that will go after stress trees. Uh, great stress opportunities for this are drought, insect defoliation, uh, compaction, and other diseases that might have moved into the tree like sap streak. So when it moves into a tree, it senses that there's stress down in the root system. The mycelial um, structure will attach to the roots and slowly start to uh, consume nutrition and block the flow uh, in the uptake of, of nutrients and water from the tree. You can see in that upper life left photo that that white material is what's called a mycelial fan of the armillary root disease. That's what's usually involved in, in killing the tree. That's down at the root systems and it can start to grow at the lower part of the, uh, of, of the bud of the tree down at the base. But once the tree is killed, you'll start to see the development of these rhizomorphs. These rhizomorphs are in that image on the right. These are uh, like shoestring-like uh, strings that can travel through the soil, just underneath the soil, up to like five, six feet and move from uh, one stump or one tree to another. And so this is how armillaria makes its more long distance um, uh, trans transmission. Does, we do have spore production on the basidiocarps, the mushrooms, but we also get this, this even more effective uh, spreading through the rhizomorphs. One of the big risk factors for armillaria is, a, is providing a hardwood food base. So when stumps are created in, in a stand through you know, harvesting or whatever it might be, that stump stays alive for a period of time. And as it's slowly starting to wink out, armillaria can move in, invade it, and it can uh, sap a lot of nutrition and develop a more vigorous state uh, from that consumption of that root system in that stump and then move out from there. And so a good idea, if possible, actually in some cases is to remove stumps or debark the stumps of trees that are cut down because otherwise armillaria can just kind of move in, hang out and build up its, its virulence on that food base. So that is a risk factor uh, for the armillaria spread. Um, it's all over the place. As long as trees are generally healthy, this thing is not gonna be a problem and trees can recover from it. Um, signs of it infecting a tree um, beyond just the actual uh, signs of it uh, would be the symptoms. Symptoms in the crown would be dieback, usually uh, on the outer tips are signaling that you might have armillaria root disease infection. And then one of the big things that we've seen here, uh, I think was around 2020, I think was, was it uh, 2021 maybe was the first year I started seeing this really prominently was I was up doing aerial surveys around Russ County and I noticed all kinds of sugar maple flagging. It would be sometimes a single limb, sometimes a a portion, not like 50%, but a portion of the crown would all of a sudden be, be this fiery brown color and there'd be dead limbs. And I wondered what, what that was. Well, uh, our colleague, former colleague, Brian Schwingle in Minnesota, uh, took some time to really investigate it and linked it back, these dead limbs in the upper crown, but not always the upper crown, to squirrel damage, uh, where squirrels and usually in late, late winter, early spring, were feeding on the bark and the tissues of the, of the stem and girdling them. And so we get, not until really the end of July, uh, the trees finally, the branch is finally dehydrating enough. It's under so much water stress during that high period of summer that it, the, you get the sudden browning and death of this limb. And so you could, you could actually see it across whole landscapes from a plane. Now, although the plane wasn't that high, it was 700 feet, but it was pretty, pretty widespread down in Russ County and it was up in Sawyer County too. So this was an issue um, generally, you know, talking about we've got both porcupine damage more on the right and then squirrel damage on the left. These, these can be factors in the sugar bush. Uh, usually porcupine damage is going to be more prominent. It's going to be on that main stem and can cause enough damage where it might, it might girdle and kill a tree. But I've seen it quite a bit this year. I've gotten a number of reports and seen it out in the field. And it's usually on smaller, you know, sapling size trees, not, not bigger ones for the most part. Bigger ones will have damage on them, you know, full-size trees, but it's usually on, on limbs up above. A few scattered limbs or some limbs might be very, very denuded, but it's not the whole crown. And so usually with the tree, life will go on, uh, but it is something to be aware of. Um, I had just a landowner 
uh, just two days ago called me about this asking what why are all the branches on the sugar maple dying well it was most likely squirrel damage from over the winter and it's finally signaling uh, as those uh, limbs are under water stress so um, just an awareness thing something to watch out for in the woods and um, yeah so really Tony that was kind of the bulk of what I've got here and I just want to open it up for questions and see if we can wow I really took a long time talking there but <laughs> We, uh, we can open it up for questions and see if there's anything we can all learn from. Yeah, that sounds good. Thank you, Paul. There was a, a lot to get through and it kind of, yeah, it's eye-opening to see all of the potential threats to the sugar bush. And I think, you know, one big takeaway that I have is as a, a maple syrup producer or a sugar bush manager, you know, really focusing on the vigor of our individual trees and, you know, thinking about how we can make our trees healthy and resistant is going to be kind of the one of the most important steps that we can take on the the local scale because so much of this is happening kind of outside of the the individual parcel. So I just wanted to plug a, vi a recording of a sugar bush management maple hour that we did earlier in the year that really focuses on promoting the vigor of maple trees within your sugar bush and you know uh and is it in addition to helping with the resistance to some of these uh pests and pathogens it will also uh improve the quality of your sap and, and sugar so um outside of that i wanted to ask paul if there are other kind of big picture things that um landowners can be thinking about to help make their property more resilient to some of these uh threats whether they're here now or um coming yeah uh, definitely um climate change is a huge factor that we're going to be dealing with in in all of our lifetime and beyond and so i can't speak to specific recommendations on how climate change and warming is going to affect sugar maple forests but it's certainly going to manifest itself in more extreme events we all know that we hear about that on the news all the time and for God's sakes, you should have been up here in Hayward a couple of days ago. I, maybe it was just as bad where you are, but the, the wildfire smoke, which it definitely is a signal of climate change coming. But we're going to see more intense events, more intense rainfall, more intense uh, wildfire types events, droughts, uh, cold snaps, warm ups in the winter, a lot of environmental climate driven types of stressors on the stand. So uh, this is really a plug to look at silviculture methods that keep trees as vigorous as possible in the stand and that promote, um, if, if it's appropriate for production in a sugar bush, uh, advanced regeneration and keep other uh, cohorts coming up through the pipeline if overstory trees die so that there's enough uh, sort of built-in resilience and size and age classes, and to some extent, maybe even diversity, but that gets into some species diversity, but I, I don't know what thresholds and really types of uh, levels of diversity are appropriate for a sugar bush, but generally for forests outside of that, I say diversity is really gonna be helpful. We, we just don't know what the next tree pest killer is going to be. Um, we know that these climate events are going to further strain and make the existing invasives like spongy moth, the existing natives like forest tent caterpillar uh, more active and more damaging. Uh, for example here, Tony, like, when you look at some of the history of forest tent caterpillar back in uh, the Northeast, back, I think it was in the late 70s and 80s, they mapped 30,000 acres of heavy decline in mortality in sugar maple in the Northeast, not because of forest tent caterpillar alone, but because forest tent caterpillar coincided with a extreme drought during a couple of years. And so obviously like we've had here in, in Northern, in my county, where I, this county I live in here, Sawyer County, I think it was the, the driest June on record since the 1800s this year. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have much spongy moth down here, but imagine if we mix that in with spongy moth or forest tent caterpillar, we are, we are in for trouble. So we just don't know what to expect. And so to the extent you can maintain tree vigor, maintain some diversity up against these unknown and colliding stressors, uh, the better off things will be. Yeah, that's a great answer. I think, you know, just off the top of my head, the, there is definitely a push within sugar bushes to, you know, really focus on maple 
whether it's just the the sugar maple or including red maple in there too. Um, but we like to see at least, you know, 25% of the trees to be non maple species um, is kind of the number that we're shooting for at the low end of diversity. But I think that's a really important consideration for, for sugar bush managers are thinking about those tree species and understory species outside of just the maple that we're, you know, harvesting our crop from. Mm -hmm. um, I don't see any questions in the chat. So I just want to finish off with a final plug to, you know, recommend everybody who's watching here live and then all the folks on the recording to to reach out to Paul if you're in his area or one of his colleagues around the state. I think they provide just a yeah, just a fantastic service to to landowners and folks um all across the state. I know I live uh in Bill McNeese region, so I reach out to him when I've got questions and there's just as you can tell with the presentation today, so much going on out there and it's just yeah. kind of changing state of, you know, threats and, and pathogens and with the, you know, environmental conditions. So it's ever evolving and it's great to have the specialists available to help us out. So if there's any final plugs you want to make, Paul? I uh, no, just, you know, this, this big opportunity was to let people know we are out there. We are a service for you to help you at that acreage scale that you and it are working at. So uh, think of us as a resource, look us up online, look at the information we have. If you ever have questions and don't be afraid to reach out. That's why we're here. All right. Thank you so much, Paul. Really appreciate it. I want to thank everybody who was able to attend today and then all those who watch online in the future. Take care. And uh, again, yeah, feel free to connect. We're, we're here to help. So thanks, Tony. Yep. Bye-bye.